Hello, everybody. Is this the right place for the math and geometry brush up course? Oh, I guess not. I understand the show will start in approximately one minute. There's not enough time to pop your popcorn, but you could open your candy, another good nutritional Saturday morning food. Not to mention a Bloody Mary when you see what's going to happen to your estate. If the Bernie Sanders bills pass, is, <laughs> it'll make your head spin. So the show will start in about 30 seconds. There's a lot of people here. Look at hair. All right, don't tell Alan I was here. He's going to start pretty soon. Here he comes. Hello, I'm Alan Gassman, and welcome to our question and answer session on estate and tax and trust planning. Last week, Brandon Ketron and I were here, and we gave a 30 minute talk that lasted about 38 minutes. And then we had a lot of really good questions. So many of you were on that first uh, talk that we had last week, some of you were not. We have a lot of uh, tax lawyers here today. We've got a lot of CPAs here today. And then we have a lot of people who are not tax lawyers and CPAs. And those people have our sympathy as you learn a very interesting area of the law, a very interesting area in the tax law and a very challenging area right now. For, now for you professionals, we did a one and a half hour talk with Professor Jerry Hash for the Leinberg system. Uh, the Leinberg system has given us permission to use the slides from this presentation, but there is a not so free presentation on the Leinberg system, uh, 90 minutes for uh, professionals. Here, as I said last week, is a typical married couple. You can see how happy they are because they have over $11,700,000 worth of assets, which is the prime barometer of happiness. And I have affectionately uh, named them first dying spouse and surviving spouse. That is not their actual names, however. And as you know, most affluent families for Florida and many other states have separate revocable trusts, one for each spouse. And the first spouse who dies can leave up to $11,700,000 into a trust that benefits the surviving spouse and is never subject to a state tax on the second death. Or if the first dying spouse passes away and doesn't use the entire 11 million seven, whatever's left becomes a portability allowance for the surviving spouse. So for mo most married couples in the United States who have not done a lot of gifting, they now have a $23,400,000 total allowance. They don't have to do much. Spouse, die spouse one dies. Everything goes in a family trust up to 11 million seven, or if it goes outright to the surviving spouse, now the surviving spouse has his 11 million seven allowance plus the 11 million seven of the first dying spouse. So that's, that's really nice. The Sanders bill would reduce the 11 million seven to only 3 million five, which would be 7 million combined for a married couple. Now, that's the reason that I'm going to write an article, again, my third article called When to Unplug Great Grandpa, because if this bill were to pass, you would want Great Grandpa to go ahead and finish his life, if at all possible, in 2021, so that Great Grandma would have an 11 million seven portability allowance, as opposed to only a 3 million five portability allowance. And of course, they can fund a trust for their lovely children, affectionately known as child one and child two. And this trust could own life insurance or other assets and pass estate tax free. And today, this couple could give $23,400,000 worth of assets to this trust and pay no gift tax. And then they have no exemption left, but 23,700,000 then grows and grows and grows to pass estate tax free. The Sanders bill would reduce this gifting allowance to only a million dollars a person, and it would not even be indexed for inflation because he doesn't want wealthy people to push income producing assets to their children, have it taxed at the child's level, and then the child just gives it right back with an $11,700,000 exemption 
when the parent wants it back. Of course, in real life, that doesn't happen, but in fiction and it, by expectation, it often does. So those are the two biggest part of the Sanders bill. The, the, um, the third uh, big element is relating to funding an irrevocable trust for family members. And most often this is called a SLAT, a spousal limited access trust. I could place all my assets into an irrevocable trust with my wife, Marsha, as the trustee. Marsha would be able to take whatever she needs for health education, maintenance, maintenance and support from that for that trust and anything she wants to give our children or charity. And that trust is out of my estate for estate tax purposes because I gave it away. And it's not in Marsha's estate for estate tax purposes because she is limited to what she needs for health education, maintenance and support, even though she can direct where it goes. So that is a very, very popular tool right now. And this is probably the most uh, uh, common arrangement that we're setting up for clients who are concerned about this situation. Well, here's a really nice thing about this trust. It is not subject to income tax. So if it earns $300,000 of taxable income, it pays no tax. Marcia and I pay the tax on our Form 1040. So it is like a gift to the trust. And now we could sell assets to this trust, income tax-free, because this trust is what we call defective for income tax purposes. That it was called defective back in the 1940s when Congress uh, passed the law, because back then it was a bad thing because of the way tax brackets worked. Now it's a very good thing. It's so good that Bernie Sanders has targeted it specifically. And his new law says, if you have one of these set up before the new law would pass, it's grandfathered and you can continue to pay the taxes on its behalf. You can sell assets to it. You can buy assets from it, et cetera, et cetera. But once the law is passed, then any new such trust or any change in such a trust will cause it to be included in the estate for estate tax purposes. So after this law passes, you'll only be able to do trusts that have to pay their own taxes and then you can't do tax-free sales to them. The other thing Bernie says is that if this limited partnership is worth a million dollars and I transfer a 99% limited partner interest to the trust I just showed you, I would value that at about $650,000 because I'm giving a non-voting interest. The trust has no right to vote, no right to receive a distribution. So we take a discount and therefore you save a lot more estate tax. If this was a $20 million limit, dollar limited partnership and I gave 99% to this trust, I could report that as a $12 million or $13 million gift and get $7 million out of my estate right off the bat. Or I could sell the 99% interest in exchange for a $13 million note owed to me. No income tax on that, no income tax on the interest payments the trust would pay me. I would pay all the income tax on the $20 million in the limited partnership. And everybody's very happy, especially the next generation and the generation after that. So what Bernie Sanders' bill says is, if you set that up before the bill passes, they don't touch it. But once the bill passes, you cannot change it. So even if you've set one of these up in 2012 or thereafter and you're very happy with it, take a very close look because you may not be able to change it and make sure you have what you want in that trust and what you want in your name because you can swap assets with it tax-free now. You may not be able to after that bill passes. So the short summary here uh, effective 2022, the exemption goes down to two, three million five per person. The portability allowance stays where it is. The, the gift tax exemption goes down to a million a person if this passes. The estate tax rate goes up. Those of you who are over a billion in assets, 
you'll be in the 65% bracket. And uh, if you're over a billion dollars in assets, our firm will give you a free one half hour consultation. Then number five, uh, the Granter Trust created after enactment would either have to pay its own income taxes, would not be able to enter into tax-free uh, uh, transactions with the grantor, or would be included in the grantor's estate. We don't know about life insurance trusts. We think that the life insurance industry will do its normal thing and give a lot of money to congressmen and senators campaign funds in order to be uh, grandfathered. We don't know about that yet for sure. So um, another thing to point out is when you do set up these defective grant or trusts, these slats, you may not get an income tax step up in the assets inside the trust when uh, they when someone dies, when the grantor dies. Right now, our law firm believes there's a good chance you do get a step up, but most law firms and most authorities do not agree with us. Um, but once this law passes, you would not get the step up. So while you're saving a lot of estate tax here on the death of, of the uh, father, you end up not get, paying more capital gains tax when the assets are initially sold. Right now, the estate tax is 40%, the capital gains tax is 20%, no big deal necessarily, but uh, that may change. So it's something to uh, think about. Grant or retain annuity trusts, which are very good uh, planning techniques for people over 50 million normally, I would say, uh, won't be around if the Sanders bill passes the way it's now uh, proposed. I don't think they'll be as useful as they are now. Professor Hesch disagrees with me, but we'll see the final verbiage. Uh, generation skipping trusts, which shield estate tax at every generation, would be taxed every 50 years. So I hope that one doesn't pass. And then, uh, by the way, our firm will give a free one hour consult uh, for anyone who is watching this webinar, but the consult will be 50 years from today. Send me an email, put in the RE line, 50 year free consult, we'll put it on the calendar. Who knows what that could be worth in 50 years. Brandon Ketron's gonna be very busy. So then effective 2022, the most you can put into an irrevocable trust and use your gift tax exemption will be 30,000 per donor. So if Marsha and I had 10 children, right now we'd be able to put 300,000 a year into a trust that would never be subject to estate tax. That's 300,000 each. No, no, that's 300,000 combined. Now we would be limited to 60,000. So there's gonna be a lot of people loaning money to life insurance trusts uh, as a result of that. And then there's going to be benefits for conservation easements for farmers um, and for paying the estate tax over time if you are a qualified business. Now, uh, if you do a slat, you have to be very careful to only take distributions to pay the expenses of the spouse who is the beneficiary. So I like to tell clients you could pay half of your joint living expenses. But the spouse could provide that the trust will be held for the donor spouse after the death of the beneficiary spouse if that is not intended when the trust is set up and is put into place at a later time. If you form the SLAT and operate it out of an asset protection trust jurisdiction like Nevada, Alaska, or South Dakota, then you could have a mechanism where the grantor that would be me in our example, would be added back to the trust if I ever became financially destitute. And if people called trust protectors who are appointed in the document would allow me back in. And the SLAT can loan money to the family, but it should be on arm's length uh, terms. So there's a lot of things about a SLAT. We are not fans of reciprocal SLATs. I am not comfortable that I could make a trust for Marsha and our descendants, and that approximately the same time, Marsha could make a trust for me and our descendants. First of all, if you know Marsha, she probably wouldn't make a trust for me. She would probably make a trust just for our descendants. But you know, in addition to that, we're just not comfortable 
that even though these trusts are not exactly the same, they have this bell and whistle, that bell and whistle, there is some support for that proposition, but uh, we have reasons to believe that that won't work if the IRS ever truly uh, challenges it. So uh, we have a lot of questions that we received. I'm sorry I'm not able to answer all of them, but if we did, don't get to your question, uh, if you could just resend it and put in the RE line, another darned, D-A-R-N-E-D -E question. I don't think darn question is the right word. Okay, is it possible to undo a gift to a friend or relative made in an earlier year where the Form 709 was filed? And, you know, apparently this person went on vacation with their friend or relative for two weeks, and now they want to undo the trust. And the answer is, it depends on what the trust says. In many of our trusts, we provide that trust protectors will have the ability to take out a beneficiary or to decide that that beneficiary won't receive anything, it'll only go to the next uh, generation. Otherwise, in general, you need to prove that there was a mistake, not a mistake when you chose this person as a friend, but a mistake when you made the trust or you have to have the person sign up. So do try to have flexible trusts, have two or three beneficiaries so that after you get back from that two week vacation, especially if you've shared an Airbnb with them, then uh, your friend, the trust protector, can exclude them from the trust. Number two, by the way, I love the wood background. What, but it's not real wood. What is the likelihood of them passing legislation to reduce the gift exemption amount within the year 2021 and make it retroactive to the beginning of the year? I think the likelihood of that is less than 1%. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that all the multimillionaires who support Democrats would be very happy if they don't have some warning. So I think there will be some warning on reducing the exemption if it does get reduced. Remember, it automatically comes down to half in 2026. There may not be warning as to the loss of discounts or to the loss of defective grant or trusts. So we're, we are asking clients, if you're gonna do a defective grant or trust like a SLAT or a, a Nevada trust, please get with us sooner rather than later, or of course, get with the uh, lawyer of your choice. If a gift is made to an irrevocable trust in the beginning of the year for the, and the law is changed, there is no way to get the gift out unless you make the gift reversible to begin with. What would it, yes, can you do a reversible gift? The answer is yes. You can do something, if you're married, you can do something called a lifetime Q-tip where you put the gift in and you have until October of next year to decide whether to terminate the gift by making an election to qualify the trust for what's called the marital deduction and then the trustee of the trust can just give the asset to your spouse and there was like no gift made. So you could do a Q-tip slap and uh, that's possible. It's a little bit complicated and it would have to pay all income to the spouse for life if you decided for it to work. And then theoretically at least, and some of my friends who I have a lot of confidence in are doing disclaimer trusts, where I put assets in a trust for my children and the trust says, but if my children issue a disclaimer within nine months of the trust being funded, the assets come back to me and that should work. Um, there's also something uh, called the REAP Trust, R-E-A-P, that our law firm has written about. Uh, a reversible trust is what it stands for. If you send me an email with the RE line REAP, R-E-A-P, I will be glad to send it, uh, send you the article. Okay, I have two trusts from my mother's estate. One is generation, generation skipping tax exempt, which means it will never be taxed at my level. The other is a non-exempt trust. How will these fit into my estate plan? Well, fortunately, the GST exempt trust will never be subject to estate tax on your death, no matter how big your estate is. But unfortunately, the non-exempt trust will be considered as owned by you for estate tax purposes. So if the total of your personal assets plus the non-exempt trust assets are subject to estate tax, I mean, are over the estate tax exemption, you will pay estate tax. So you should be doing planning with the non-exempt trust and don't take anything out of the exempt trust. The exempt trust should be investing in the better investments if you can, uh, 
if that's possible. Number two, I'm divorced with two children ages 23 and 24. What can I do to, re to reduce estate taxes? Well, the first thing you can do is loan money to your children so that they can start businesses. That will definitely uh, reduce your estate. And then you can marry somebody and give them a lot of money and then divorce them and give them even more money. Or you can uh, engage in some of the techniques that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, my parents are 93 and 98 and not in the greatest of health. They have a farm in Minnesota worth 4 million with a basis of 75,000. If they live past 2021, is there any way to get a step up during 2021? Well, you could put uh, the farm in one name or the other, and then if they pass away, if that farm goes into a trust for the surviving parent, then you would get the step up, or you could put it in a joint trust called a joint exempt step up trust. But unfortunately, somebody has to die to get you the step up. Now, if you have an elderly aunt or uncle who's in worse health, your parents could form a trust for themselves and the aunt or uncle and give the aunt or uncle what's called a special power of appointment. And then if the aunt or uncle die, you could get a step up and we have done those. So if you have somebody who you love, who's not going to live longer, you could love them more by getting them involved in a trust to get a step up. It's a nice loophole, these step up trusts. They're not uh, very uh, well publicized. When they get well publicized, I'm sure that Congress will do away with them but they are not in the Sanders bill. So that was a great question, thank you. How should clients in the mid 60s with eight to 10 million net worth best prepare for potential future tax changes? I would like specific suggestions for actions to be taken in 2021. And the first action is to see a good uh, tax lawyer who can run the numbers for you but most likely I would form a spousal limited access trust for one of you and have the other of you put significant assets into that spousal limited access trust. The problem is, you know, at eight or 10 million, you're really middle class compared to what a millionaire was uh, 30 years ago. So that's why the spousal limited access trust allows you to live off of it and put in a divorce clause so that if there's a divorce, it divides into two slats and put it in an asset protection jurisdiction. So I'll show you some numbers in a, in a couple of minutes. Well, maybe I should do that now. So let me go to, and I got an a, uh, email from a client on Friday, and now I get to charge him for explaining this because he'll, he'll be able to watch this. So I have affectionately named him John Smith, He's 82 years old, and then he's married to Jane Smith, who is a very, very tolerant lady. So uh, they have a home in New Jersey or somewhere like that, and they have a condo in Panama City or somewhere like that, and they have a ranch that they live on in Colorado or somewhere like that worth three million five. They have a lot of horses there. And then they have a family limited partnership with investments worth nine million eight. So right now they're way under 23 million, but they're very much endangered if the exemption goes down in 2026. And they're in a heap of trouble if it goes down uh, to three million five. Now, John's life expectancy, according to the IRS tables, is only 9.1 years. We have to use that for certain calculations, but we know from the real world that he's got about 11 to 12 years on average. The interest rate that he could charge for a note, if he sold assets in exchange for a note, would be 1.8% if we get it done this month. The interest rate for a self-canceling note would be much higher. It would be, I'm sorry that you can't see it on the screen, but I think it would be about uh, 11% for a self-canceling note. Jane is a little uh, younger. Her life expectancy, according to the IRS, is 11.1 .1 years. And she could sell assets on a 1.8% note. Or if she sold for a note that canceled on her death, 
it would have to pay her 8.2%, but if she dies, the note goes away and there's no tax. So if you're in poor health, but you have at least a reasonable period of time to, to live, you should consider a self-canceling installment note. The IRS doesn't like these and they've challenged them, but there's ways to handle that. And if you're lucky enough to die within the term and you don't have to ever file an estate tax return, the IRS is lucky, I mean, is, uh, is uh, uh, unlikely to challenge it. So what if they did a joint note, their joint life expectancy, they're one of, they're, at least one of them should live at least 14.2 years, according to the IRS. And uh, the note could bear interest at 6.2% and then vanish on the death of the survivor of them. So what we do is we go to page 41. And I can touch this screen and make things a little bigger. So let's, I'll show you what the big picture is and then I'll expand the screen for you. So John sets up two slats. That way I can charge him twice as much. And Spousal Limited Access Trust number one receives the New Jersey home and the Panama condo, and he's going to buy it from Jane. So he's going to owe Jane about a million fifty thousand dollars, and then he's going to put these in a slat, and Jane can use them rent free, and he can either pay rent to the trust when he uses them, which will not be taxable income and will further reduce his, his estate, or he may choose to rely upon some tax court cases which say that for some reason, when your spouse has the right to live on property in a trust, you have the right to go there also. So that is slat number one. And in exchange for putting those two properties into the slat, he's gonna receive a promissory note for $1,381,000. So see, we've reduced two million one worth of assets to one million three hundred and eighty-one thousand, taking discounts that will not be available after the new law passes. And at one point eight percent, that's going to pay him twenty-four thousand a year. If he doesn't think he's going to make it to his life expectancy, we could go with an eleven percent note, paying him one hundred and fifty-seven thousand a year. But where's he going to get that? Where's the trust going to get that money? So I think this one. John, you're gonna pay at least 24,000 a year in rent to be able to stay on these beautiful, in these beautiful properties with Jane. And then you're gonna be owed this note of a million 381 that will be in your estate when you die. Now, when you decide to turn these into Airbnbs or rental properties, and they're uh, giving you uh, $200,000 a year of income or whatever it will be, 75,000 of income, that income will stay in the slat and you'll pay the tax on it. And you'll also get the depreciation deduction. So that's slat number one. Now, what do we do with slat number two? Slat number two, we're gonna have you gift about $800,000 to slat number two. And then you're gonna sell 49.5% of the S Corp that owns the ranch and 49.5% of the S Corp that owns the limited partnership with the investments. In exchange for a note of about $4 million, that note's gonna pay you $260,000 a year. So when you die, instead of owning half of these assets, you're gonna owe, or you're gonna own only this note. And by the way, what would you pay me for a note that only bears interest at 1.8% and that only pays interest for almost 10 years or 15 years. You would not pay me 3 million nine for that note. That note, if we appraised it, is probably worth about 3 million five. So if you were to die, we would value the note at a discount. So we are reducing the estate here. Now Jane sets up a trust for descendants, puts about a million dollars in it as a seed capital gift, and makes the same type of sale. Then we sit down and we we look at your expenses. And if you spend a lot, then we we could use a self-canceling installment note. We might even have to for part of these in order to get you the cash flow that you need so you can have a great standard of living. 
not to mention the monies that you can gift every year to your to your uh, children and your in-laws and your grandchildren. So assuming that we need to have these notes reduced to under $7 million on the death of the survivor of you, we can make anything over 7 million of the notes self-canceling. So we would have partly self-canceling and partly not self-canceling. So that is uh, that answers the question of uh, the person who wanted to know what to do. Um, the answer is give a lot of the money to lawyers and then the rest of the money will go into promissory notes. Here's a question. I'm wondering if you could share a little insight on dealing with family squabbles when a second marriage husband passes and the descendants trust kicks in, the wife of the descendant, married 25 years, is being challenged from, with kids from the descendant's first marriage and grandchildren of the predeceased daughter of the descend, decedent. Um, we see this a lot. It's a bigger threat than estate tax for most American families. And the, the best thing that we know to do is while both spouses are alive, sit down with the spouses and the children of both marriage, just lay out the plan and have the children sign a legally binding agreement not to challenge it. And because most of these arrangements, quite honestly, are by, are by hook and crook and no one really thought it through. And then uh, when the first spouse dies, there can be ill feelings. And uh, this just happens all the time plan ahead as best you can, but putting these in slats and irrevocable trust is good. So at least it's locked up. If they're going to fight about it, it's not going to uh, disappear. Please elaborate with examples on the proposed million dollar capital gains tax limit for estates. Well, going back here, I guess I would say that if we set all this up for John and Jane, and we find out that the estate tax exemption is going down and the gift tax exemption is going down to a million, then John and Jane are gonna go ahead and forgive possibly all of these notes in 2021, file a gift tax return showing about 5 million each of their exemptions being used. And uh, then we have, uh, a lot of this out of their estate and they've used the exemption. Um, because if it only goes down to a million, then you will definitely wish that you had uh, gifted more. Now there is an attachment here, a white paper by uh, Jonathan Blotmacher, Marty, Marty Shinkman, and a couple of other people who I certainly uh, look up to and respect. And it's an attachment, it's in your handout folder. And if you're not, you can click on it. It's a PDF. If you're not able to get it, uh, just RE line handout. I will realize that you are not asking for a donation. We'll know to give you a handout. Okay, for younger single clients in their 30s, what's the general structure of estate planning I would recommend? And a, a, a future slat is uh, very good. Um, and by the way, we have clients in their 20s and 30s, early 30s, who have who are on their second uh, road to making over $10 million by starting a business and selling it in the tech industry. So that's off to you guys. That all the all the stories about the young people and the millennials are completely wrong. When the 32 year old walks into your office with a $30 million net worth and he actually earned it, but what that 32 year old can do is go ahead and put $11 million in a trust or put 5 million in a trust and sell a discounted LLC interest to that trust. The trust is for your future descendants and your future spouse. In fact, it's called a floating spouse provision. It's whoever you happen to be married to at a time can live off of that trust to pay half of your living expenses. And you can replace the trustee of the trust and the trustee of the trust also have to, has the discretion to give to charity and the trust is formed in an asset protection jurisdiction and you can be added as a beneficiary of the trust if your net worth ever goes below a certain amount. So uh, that works well. And I have uh, one client, a good friend of mine who is in his 60s, who did one of these trusts before he was married, before he had children, and now he's uh, married and uh, has a beautiful child. And he's very happy he did it because he's out of harm's way from the estate tax for, from, because of planning that we did in the 1990s. There's a New York question here 
that I can't even hope to answer, but I can ask my friend Marty Shinkman the answer to this one and possibly get back with you if, if he's willing to answer it. Okay, assuming that the currently pending legislation looks as if it's going to pass, can you discuss the possible methods used to protect a Roth IRA? That's a really tough one because it's stuck in the Roth IRA. You could have the Roth IRA pay to a trust that will qualify for the marital deduction, but then it'll be taxed on the surviving spouse's death if she's over the exemption. You could have the Roth IRA payable to a charity. That may not be what you want to do. Or you could withdraw the Roth IRA now and forego the future tax-free appreciation that you would have had and put it into a gifting structure or a structure similar to what I showed you for the farm, uh, for the people with the ranch. But that's a tough one. The Roth IRA, when people have a big, big IRAs, it's difficult. Now you could give a promissory note to your spouse. So you have 6 million three in a Roth IRA, but you owe your spouse 4 million. And then you die and your estate is not 6 million three, it's 2 million three. You file a, an estate tax return reporting that, but now your spouse has a large estate. You don't pay an estate tax. I uh, wish I had a better answer for you, but the promissory note may be, uh, what are the odds of them actually doing this? Going down to 7 million, I would say less than 3%. But the other stuff, taking away my blessed discounts and defective grant or trust, maybe uh, 30 or 40%. So it looks like I'm about out of time. Uh, this was a good one. If annual gifting is reduced to 30,000 per donor with a maximum allocation of 10,000 per donee, it's actually 15 per donee, will I be able to make 529 contributions? And the answer is, I'm not sure because the, the uh, proposed legislation basically says if you're making a gift to a trust or something that the beneficiary can't immediately get into, then you don't get the, anything above 30 a person on the exemption. So I guess if the 529 plan is owned by the grandchild and the grandchild can get into it, whether the parents and grandparents want him to or not, then I would say it would qualify. But if it's going into a 529 plan that the parent holds over that cute little grandchild's head, then I don't think you can go over the 60, but we will hopefully get some clarification on that. Number two, if you have an islet and your premiums are more than 60,000 a year per parent, it will hopefully be grandfathered, but if not, you'll be loaning the premium money in at low interest rates under what we call the split dollar loan regime, R-E-G-I-M-E. -E. If you Google split, split dollar loan advance, you'll see that it's a pretty darn advantageous thing because you put the premium money in and you don't get it back until the person dies and it's with, and you don't get any interest payments until then, and it's at a very low rate. So that's probably what's going to happen there. So for a lot of you, um, this is one we are working on right now, a $350 million value for a part ownership of a business. A 60% non-voting member interest would be worth about $147 million. Uh, the interest payment on this would be not a million four seven, more like two million five. Um, so a seed capital gift of, of 14 million seven hundred, which a married couple could make. So this would reduce this person's estate uh, by quite a bit. And then all the income, 60% of the income goes to this trust, which is never subject to estate tax. And the clients pay the tax on behalf of that with their 40% of ownership that they retained. If this goes to 700 million in 15 years and sells, then 60% of 700 million is, subject, is, is uh, sheltered from the estate tax. But if the IRS comes in and says, wait a minute, this, million, this 147 note should have been 247, then that's 100, a million dollar gift times a 40% gift tax, that's a $40 million gift uh, risk. And we have all sorts of techniques for reducing that risk. One technique is that anything over a million 47 in value has to go to a charity. So then instead of a gift tax, there would just be a charitable contribution to the family's foundation. 
but this is where a grant or retain annuity trust would uh, work better. And then we show it here how it works for grant or retain annuity trusts. So let me just see a couple of questions here that have come in. Sorry, I can't take your call right now. I push the red button and then the caller goes away. Okay, good morning from Orlando. Hello, Karen, thanks for joining us. Will I email the slides? Yes, the slides will be emailed by Monday morning, uh, courtesy of Kelsey with a K, K-E-L-S-E, -E, I mean, K-E-L-S-I at gasmanpa.com. Welcome, Kelsey. She's our new uh, director of education. Okay, what is, let me see. Is this a million dollar capital gain or a million dollar gift tax exemption? Tal, it's a million dollar gift tax exemption. Um, don't see the block marker attachment in the PDF. I am sorry about that. I will look at it right when we're done here and uh, send everybody that at least by Monday morning. Can you sell your interest in a Roth to an I to a to an uh, defective trust, Stuart? That's a great idea, but I don't think you can sell a Roth. I think you have to take it out. Um, and then Teresa says thank you for the information. Well, thank you very much, Teresa. I appreciate your attendance. So uh, what I ask in return for this webinar is that you ask me anything I didn't cover that you'd like to know about. We're gonna continue to talk about these topics and write about them and try to help other professionals uh, understand them to do the right things. Quite candidly, if none of these laws pass and some clients, you know who you are, have been procrastinating, even planning for what happens when it goes down to half in 2026, then Bernie Sanders has actually done a favor for wealthy Americans as opposed to what they perceive as a uh, misfavor. So, well, thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar. And if you have any questions, please send them to Brandon Ketron, B-R-A-N-D-O-N at Ketron, I mean at GassmanPA.com. Thank you very much. Okay, and thank you. Oh, there's one more question that I'll answer on my way out. And that is, where did you get all the library books? Have you not given them back in? So I'm gonna show you the secret of my library. And have a great day. Thank you.